Um, we've done a ton of different webinars on Google Analytics, on nuts and bolts of, of how things work in page views and sessions and things like that. And we thought we should take it one step further and look at more holistic, high-level view of really where your web analytics are coming from and what amazing things we can learn. Um, I'm joined today by Shelby Thayer, who's the Director of Web Strategy and CRM at Penn State Outreach and Online Education. Um, any of you who have been fortunate enough, like myself, to hear Shelby speak before, um, I think you'd really get the feeling and you really understand when you hear her talk that she's in the weeds, she's doing this stuff, she's got the strategy in place. Um, we are just really, really fortunate to have Shelby with us today. Um, and of course, I'm Becky Barterman, Vice President of Strategy at Converge Consulting. Um, Converge focuses on inbound marketing for higher education. So we do a ton of work with things like SEO, Google Analytics, other web met metrics, um, content development, uh, website redesign, digital advertising, all of those different pieces that make up that inbound marketing puzzle. So uh, a couple of quick housekeeping notes for you guys. We are recording this webinar. We'll send out an email in the next several days as soon as it's been converted and it's available on our website for you to watch back. Um, or share, hopefully. Uh, the slides will also be made available, so if you want to go out to our website, you can download them. So don't worry about trying to dribble down lots and lots and lots of notes. Um, we have also saved a chunk of time for questions at the end, so we're excited to get those from you. Think about them throughout the different presentation and um, get those ready for us at the end, and we'll leave some time for you. So without further ado, I'm going to pass this over to Shelby. All right, thanks, Becky. Uh, thank you for that introduction, and uh, hello everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, we have a fairly packed agenda, so I'm just going to uh, dive right in. And the way that uh, we've kind of structured this is when we're talking about the different tools, uh, as they come up throughout the uh, presentation, we're just going to uh, uh, talk about a, different tools that might help you uh, um, uh, with the, the certain topic and then different tool uh, alternatives to those tools. So first we're going to talk about uh, and really uh, define digital analytics and really the scope of it uh, because there, there, a lot of times when, when people are talking about web analytics or digital analytics, uh, they're really only thinking of Google Analytics and there's so much more out there. Uh, and also that, that kind of leads into the next point of, you know, you have all of these uh, different tools, uh, different things that you're trying to do. So how do you gain the leadership buy-in you need uh, uh, for the importance of digital analytics and the resources and tools that you really need to do it right? Uh, we're going to briefly talk about the basics, uh, objectives, goals, and KPIs, and then we're going to get into uh, truly measuring campaigns, troubling, uh, troubleshooting uh, potential uh, uh, challenging campaigns, uh, email marketing, social media content, and then we're going to wrap up with uh, off-site conversions and in some uh, couple techniques and in, in potentially measuring off-site conversions. Becky, I think, uh, do I have control here? There we go. Okay, so let's get started with uh, what digital anal analytics does, what it helps to do. And everything it does can really be boiled down to two things. It helps measure the success of your marketing efforts, and it helps optimize your website. And a lot of times we get kind of stuck on either or. Uh, we, we, we measure our marketing efforts, we're seeing if people are clicking through, we're seeing if they're converting, uh, but we're not doing much more beyond that. Or on the flip side, we're doing a ton of A-B testing, uh, or we're doing a lot of usability testing, but we're not paying attention to how people are getting to our website, and kind of what frame of mind they are. So these really go hand in hand. You can't really do one without the other. Once people get to your website, you know, can they do what they need to do? Can they do what you want them to do? Can they accomplish their goals? So that's what we're going to be talking about. And when we're talking about goals, making sure that your goal aligns with your user's goal. That's pretty, uh, that's pretty straightforward and basic, but a lot of times that doesn't happen. Uh, 
the uh, brand new e-expectations report that I don't even think it's actually out yet, uh, but I read a couple blog posts where they had kind of uh, sneak peeks at it. And uh, this year, 78% uh, of high school seniors said that a school website made a difference in the perception of that school. And that was up almost 10% over just last year. So that's, that's, that's pretty huge. Your, your website matters. Uh, it truly matters. So when we're talking about kind of the scope of digital analytics, I always go back to Scott Brinker. Uh, he writes a really great blog called the Chief Marketing Technologist blog. Uh, and every year he puts out what he calls this marketing technology landscape. This is the one from, was just released in January. Uh, and what this really shows are, now this is all of marketing technology, but if you think about it, marketing really is technology now. And the reason I like to put this up here is it shows just all of the companies and vendors involved in this and all of the different tools. And if you look at each of these, they, they, um, most of them have an analytics or a measurement component, or some of them are actually analytics or measurement tools. Uh, but, but most of them do have that, that uh, measurement component. So how do you kind of, wow, make sense of all this? So uh, just to give you an idea, the one he put out last January uh, had 947 companies included. And this year it has 1,876. That's almost a 100% increase. And uh, he fully admits this is not comprehensive. Uh, uh, so just gives you an idea. And I like to pull out, too, the now, now, so we're talking Google Analytics and potentially all of these tools or, or specific tools to obviously help in web and mobile, mobile analytics. But when we're talking about digital analytics, don't forget that we're talking about voice of customer and testing and optimization. And are you, are you looking at your email marketing metrics and, and what's really working there? And of course, SEO. Uh, so I really like to show this, uh, show this graphic so, so people get an understand of, of understanding of what we're really talking about when we're talking about digital analytics. And that leads right into the next step. So we have all of these tools out there. We have all of these uh, things that we're doing that we need to measure. So doing this right takes a ton of resources. It takes time. It takes money. It takes people. And how do we make the argument to get the resources that we really need? Uh, how do we get leadership to kind of buy in to this importance of digital analytics? And it really starts with knowing that audience, the, the, the what's in it for me uh, um, effect. And in my experience, I think the number one thing that has gotten, uh, that is, uh, leadership kind of cares about or what I've seen is showing them the struggle. So, uh, and let me back up when I say leadership, you know, that could be senior leadership. It could be your direct supervisor. It could be management that could really be a, a, a broad spectrum. Um, but showing them people struggling on your website. That's been one of, uh, I think, the, 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 the biggest things that, that we've, we've um, been able to do is, uh, and the biggest things for buy-in for, for leadership. Uh, when they see that, they're, they're, they're shocked. Uh, the other thing is, is and I've, I've learned this throughout my experience too, is don't be that stealth bomber. Don't go in there with just problems. Come with solutions as well. And then set the expectations. Be realistic. We all know that you know, we're all using Google Analytics and we know that it can tell us what is happening on our website, but it can't tell us why it's happening. And that's where these other tools and these other uh, techniques like usability testing, et cetera, come in. Uh, Google Analytics can't make our coffee for us in the morning, uh, and we have to set that expectation that, it, that that's, uh, that can't happen. So when we're talking about showing the struggle, usertesting.com is a really, really good tool uh, um, to do this. And We've been using it for a year. There are obviously a ton of alternatives out there. Loop 11 is one, Open Hallway, Try My UI. Um, 
but they all do basically the same thing. So if you have, uh, uh, you've written up some tasks that you want users to walk through, uh, you can um, put in some demographic information, get a panel, and then you get a, a video, a screenshot of those people walking through uh, those specific tasks, and they're asked to uh, think out loud. And a couple great examples. So, so this will, doing this will um, obviously confirm a lot of what you already know, potentially. Uh, but we have seen that it also brings up issues that you may be completely blind to because you're too close to it. So a perfect example of this is years ago when um, uh, our group was involved with uh, usability testing, uh, user testing on the uh, main Penn State uh, homepage. Uh, they were re redesigning that. And we did some user.com or usertesting.com uh, um, tests. And one thing that one of the tasks was something about tuition, you know, um, what is the tuition rate for X? And what we found out is when people were going through that scenario, we, uh, uh, on that specific page, it said uh, instead of kind of in-state, out-of-state, it had uh, in PA, in outside of PA, or something like that. It said PA. And multiple users said, oh, huh, PA, PA, oh, okay, Pennsylvania. And they got it, of course. But it goes back to the Steve Krug, don't make me think. It took them, you know, 15 seconds to really get, oh, okay, they mean P um, Pennsylvania. Or a lot of times we'll use the, the Commonwealth instead of saying Pennsylvania. Uh, so that was something that everybody was completely blind to and, and something that came up. So, so that was interesting. So what do we do first when we're uh, talking about uh, um, measuring our marketing efforts and measuring and optimizing our website? Obviously, we need to know what our business objectives are, know what those website goals are, and really document and, and take down our key performance indicators. And a, and a key thing here is to get leadership involved in these discussions. Uh, so when we're talking about our business objectives, uh, keep it super, super simple. You know, if you are oversee the admissions website, if you're in admissions, you, you want to get students, uh, you want to get applicants, so just state that's it. Uh, um, you know, maybe you're an alumni, you want to you wanna get members, you want to get donations. So be very, very uh, um, short and specific. And then, then if that is your business goal, then why does your website exist? So we're, our website may exist to capture leads, to inform prospects, or to get applications. And one thing I want to point out here is some of us have let's say, uh, the ultimate conversion or the ultimate goal, maybe on another website. So our particular website exists to inform, let's say, prospects about a particular program. And then they go off to another website to kind of take that action to enroll or, or whatever it is. So, so again, put that down. So, so our, our goal or our website exists to inform uh, people. Uh, some of you may actually work on internal websites. So let's say your student portal or some kind of internal intranet or portal. So your website might exist to make it easy for people to pay their bill or register for a class or, or uh, request more information, et cetera. And then you want to translate those into concrete goals, things that you could potentially measure uh, in whatever analytics tool you're using in, in Google Analytics. So we're talking about visit campus or apply or donate. Um, if you're, let's say, uh, overseeing a news website, uh, it might be to get subscribers uh, or to get a bigger reach. Uh, you want to get uh, people from from a, a, a bigger uh, geographic area uh, um, to your website and consuming your information. So it all depends on obviously uh, what your business objective is. And then when we're talking about goals and conversions, don't forget to kind of uh, break these out into the micro conversions and the macro. Again, sometimes the macro conversion happens off of our site. Uh, or even if the macro conversion happens on our site, typically 
if that goal is to apply, people uh, at the very top level of the funnel who are just kind of researching, they're not going to come to your website immediately and apply immediately. So what are those specific steps that they take to make that decision to apply? They need to read about your school. They need to read about your majors and programs. Maybe they watch a couple videos. So think about those micro conversions and if you can potentially track those as well because those are the things that are going to to step them to your uh, macro goal or your macro conversion. So when we're talking about everybody knows, you know, key performance indicators, what do we measure to see if our website is actually meeting uh, its goal? So let's talk about a specific example. So let's say our goal is to apply. Uh, we maybe uh, will measure the consumption of the academics pages. Uh, have those increased? Because again, thinking about our micro goals, people need to read about the school or the program before they'll potentially want to apply. Use of that tuition calculator, your tuition estimate has increased by X. And then the obvious ones, application starts and application submits. And, and sometimes these are, again, um, less easily measured uh, uh, if it's kind of the ultimate goal. And if, if let's say, it's enrollment, uh, uh, it's less easy, easily measured. Or if it's a donation, sometimes, you know, it happens off of your site. So it's kind of hard to attach the behavior of people on your site to that conversion. But put it down anyway. So let's get in and really talk about measurements. So we're going to go over kind of campaigns, email marketing, social media, my favorite topic, attribution, uh, explain attribution a little bit, um, go into content effectiveness, and wrap it all up with uh, off-site conversions. So when we're talking about tracking a campaign, um, it's really, really important, and this is kind of one of my pet peeves, is it's really important to use a standard convention for that trackable URL that you're going to create. Uh, and I see this time and time again that the uh, um, different, let's say, um, in this example, we're talking about email. Uh, um, different people are inputting the data, and they input the data differently. So what happens is you get to your reporting, and you want to report out on Medium, and then you have three different ways that kind of email is spelled out. So how can you kind of overcome that problem? Uh, one great way is to have, you know, one person do all the input uh, and to do all the or to do the input uh, more regularly and sometimes that's not realistic. So what are some tools or techniques that we can use? Everybody's seen the, the form on the left. That's the Google Analytics uh, URL builder form. Um, but we can uh, we can create smart pr spreadsheets to and create um, specific drop downs so different people using it can only uh, uh, um, choose specific channels or, or, or sources or mediums, et cetera. Uh, there's tools out there like Terminus uh, that really help you with that. It's kind of a smart spreadsheet on steroids. Uh, and they can really help you do, do the same thing for sometimes no and in, in, in the low cost. But really, really important. And, and when we're saying a standard convention, uh, we're saying that it should be exactly the same. Not similar, but exactly the same. So what are the steps we take when we're measuring a campaign? So obviously, we, want, we need to know what the goal of the campaign is and what the audience is, what our target audience is. And when we think about our target audience, we want to think about kind of what stage of, the, of their, their journey are they in. Um, so, you know, Avinash, if you read Avinash Kaushik's blog, he, he talks about the see, think, do, care breakdown. So when we're talking about this, uh, if you have your audience, you're really targeting those in the real 
research stage, uh, then you don't want to um, uh, have your, let's say, call to action on the ad to apply, uh, because that might not make sense. So really uh, uh, knowing which stage of the, their journey that your audience is in. And then obviously, is your landing page, is it relevant to where they came from? Um, can they tell once they get there that, oh, okay, I'm in the right spot and I know exactly what to do? And that leads into the other one, the call to action. And then the other one I kind of put up here that, that is, is so often forgotten is what's the next step? So when you're measuring these campaigns, when you're putting the campaigns out there, um, really go through that campaign and, and go to the landing page and, 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 and take that action. And then once you take that action, then what's the next step? Uh, what is your follow through? What is your follow up to them? And think about that. So when we're specifically measuring the campaign, again, let's say, for instance, our, um, our audience are really in that research mode. They really are not sure, uh, let's say, um, if they a, if they even want to go to school, uh, let's say if they uh, they are not sure what school they want, they're not sure what degree they they may want or what major they may want. So when you're measuring your campaign, what you want to measure needs to tie to what the goal of the campaign. Is. So in this specific instance, we might use new visits as a, as a metric. Uh, are we getting new visits? Um, if our campaign is geared toward those people lower in the funnel, then we may want to look at repeat visits. Um, then those stickiness metrics, the bounce rate and time on site and pages per visit. And here we want to be careful about what type of website we have because in our earlier example, if we're overseeing a news website, um, you're, somebody coming from a campaign or coming from organically uh, uh, from a, a search, uh, they may come to a specific page, read all they uh, need to read and leave immediately. And Google Analytics is going to uh, trigger a bounce and say that, well, they didn't go on to a next, the next page, so it's a bounce. So when you're thinking about this, you have to really think about what type of, of, of website you have and if you want to use these metrics, if it makes sense for you to use these metrics. And then, of course, the conversion. Did they fill out that form and did they actually apply or, or whatever? And again, don't forget the what's next. So then they fill out that form. So then what's the next step? So let's say that you're building your campaign and you've launched it and things are all wrong. Uh, you're getting, let's say you're getting a lot of traffic, but for some reason your bounce rate is really high. Uh, you're not getting any conversions and you're not really sure what the problem is. So what are some steps that you can go through? Well, first and foremost, you obviously want to go through the past steps. So are you targeting the right audience? Are they um, in the right stage of their journey? Um, does the landing page tie to the ad and the stage? Uh, and again, um, uh, sometimes I'm shocked at how many uh, people kind of don't step through those marketing campaigns through to the conversion themselves so they can see that for themselves. Uh, and then once they get to your website, is that information easily found? So if you've gone through all that, you, you kind of, you know, okay, well, it looks to be okay. So, so what are some other things that I can do? So one thing that's, that, that you can do that's really, really um, uh, can, can help a lot is building a segment in Google Analytics for that campaign. So let's say all of these things are happening. You're not getting your conversions, super high bounce rate. Build a segment for that campaign. So filter out everybody else. Just look at the people coming in through that campaign. And obviously they're not converting. So for people who aren't bouncing, what else are they doing? Um, this is when you want to look at those micro conversions. Uh, so are they taking those steps necessary to get to that macro conversion? Uh, and one, one item that, that we've used that's been uh, really helpful that I, I think is underutilized is internal site search. 
But when we're talking about Google Analytics and we talk about, well, it can only tell you what's happening, it can't tell you why, internal site search is something you can use to kind of get to the why. You can kind of get to the, uh, you know, this is kind of user in input uh, um, um, information that you can see to kind of get to that why. And then again, going back to your micro conversions, uh, are they looking at specific pages and then taking into account the behavioral difference between people on mobile and people on desktop? So next, let, next let's talk about um, measuring email and email effectiveness. And I'm not going to go through this again. It's the, really the same steps when you're, when you're setting up those email campaigns. And a lot of times the email campaign, again, is the next step of their journey. So you brought people here to your website. Uh, they're kind of in research mode. They've signed up for, let's say, your newsletter or they've requested information. Uh, and then you capture that information. And then you're going to follow up with an email series. So let's measure the effectiveness of those emails. So when we're talking about the right stage, then the KPI is going to be further down in the funnel. So it may, the KPI for, for these emails may be to apply, or maybe they're reminders to enroll, or, or whatever that is. And before you're sending out, hopefully you're testing the email. And a really good tool to use for testing is called Litness. And I'm not sure if, if, if anybody's familiar with this tool, but we found it very effective. And what it can show is uh, various clients that people use for email. You can choose the clients or not. So if you're using a bulk email tool and you know what clients uh, people are using to read your email, um, be sure, obviously, you, you check those. And as important, you don't want to check the ones that are rarely or, or are never used because what you what can happen is then you kind of go down a rabbit hole of trying to 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 tweak a pixel here and there for a specific client that that nobody potentially uses. And Litness is a great um, tool. It has a free trial. You can test what your um, email looks like with images blocked, uh, preview subject lines, how long they are, what they look like in different um, um, clients. It has a spam filter. Uh, um, and it, it also has a workaround for the uh, recent, you know, months and months ago, Gmail, Gmail changed how they... Uh, uh, how images behaved in email, so now they're cached, so they're open, or they're, they're I'm sorry, they're, they're cached, so they don't download every time. And if you're measuring email, you know that's how the opens are measured. So they look at the, uh, um, a pixel image, and they say, has this been downloaded? OK, if it has, I'm going to register an open. Um, well, Gmail completely changed how they did that. So that's really skewed, and Litmus actually has a workaround for that. So that's a really neat thing. So what are we looking at when we're talking about metrics for measuring email? The obvious ones are delivery rate and open rate. Um, and, you know, as you all probably know, open rate is skewed if, if the uh, email client uh, is, is, um, uh, is uh, the images are blocked uh, by default. Most email clients have that. Uh, so that's why it's really important to think about your open rate as a trend, not just the specific open rate, because it could be 20% or, or what have you. That could be off by 20%. That's really OK, as long as you look at whatever the trend is. Uh, um, the click-through rate, obviously, but it's really important, too, now more, more so than ever, to really look at your spam and your unsubscribe rate. And most bulk email tools actually have engagement or some kind of quality score uh, and what they're measuring in it. Typically, it's proprietary, but what they're, they're measuring is are people opening them? Are they engaging with them? Are they clicking through? And they're, and they're potentially using those more and more uh, in their kind of send to spam. Another piece that's really um, important when you're talking about email campaigns, even if you're using a bulk email tool that will track 
all of your clicks in your email uh, um, automatically, you really still want to use your Google Analytics trackable URL, uh, regardless if your bulk email tool uh, tracks the clicks um, automatically. And the reason is, is clicking through in that email is not the goal of the email, or, or typically not the goal. I'm not sure that I um, know of an email campaign where the click was actually the goal. You want people to get to the destination, landing page, website, you want them to actually do something. So in order for you to measure that, you really need that Google Analytics tracking URL uh, because the built-in bulk email tracking is not going to uh, know once they get to your website what the behavior is, what those people are doing. So that's very important. And then obviously mobile has had a huge impact on email. Um, you know, Litness just ran a, um, um, a study and they've seen that over half of their emails are now opened on a mobile device. Responsive email templates are becoming in, um, more and more important. Uh, and one thing, if you do use a bulk email tool, typically they will, um, you can see uh, people, uh, kind of how people are reading your email and then how they're taking action. So just to think about the difference between the consumption of the email, they might be reading it on a mobile device, but, but typically uh, they, they're, they're probably taking an action, and maybe not. You have to look in, in, in your own, but uh, taking an action on a, on a laptop or, or a desktop. So that's uh, always good to kind of um, understand that difference. And now Becky's going to talk about some social media measurements. Sorry about that, hitting the mute. Thanks, Shelby. So um, we wanted to talk about how I actually have some good examples from some clients that are doing some amazing social media at work and then actually how the measurement's working out. So social media by default is going to be a little bit more social in the strategy than, um, say, an email campaign or even just a regular campaign like a paid media, something like that, in that we're not going to always send to the same landing pages. We aren't going to always have the same really... Um, easy, simple goals that we know that, that we're trying to drive to. It's not necessarily come here and immediately do this one thing. What we're doing a lot of times is we're trying to be social and we're trying to engage. So um, the way that we approach this is we utilize those uh, campaign track URLs that Shelby's mentioned several times. So it's that big, long URL, and it's got the question mark and the UTM equals the source, the medium, the campaign, all that good stuff in there. Um, if we have people that are actually tracking their social in a way that's consistent and we have good data coming into Google Analytics, this is an example of some of the really cool stuff you can get. So um, this is actually an alumni association that I work with. And you can see here, this is over a long period of time. Um, the last, uh, gosh, I don't know, nine or ten months it looks like. And um, you can see in here, if you look down on the left corner, we're pulling in the sources. And we have Facebook, we have Twitter, we have LinkedIn. So we can see the number of sessions that are coming from each of those things. But what I have circled over here is also the session duration. So that's really important to be able to look at and understand that um, Facebook, actually, people who are coming from Facebook are spending a little bit more time on our site. So you can start to get some of those more, um, the, the additional information that you can add in and tell the story. Um, the next thing that these guys are doing that's, really incredible and I recommend that you all think about doing this is remember Shelby was talking about how you have to make sure you have kind of a system set up in the way that you're actually tracking these things so what these guys have done is they've used their campaign field consistently for the past 10 months and every single thing that gets posted out there on all of their different channels they identify which type of content it is so remember this is an alumni association so they talk about things that um or an impact to the spirit, impact to the specific college, student impact, faculty impact. They um, tag their giveaways that they do separately. So not only do they know which channel someone's coming from, but they're able to start to drill down and understand that, you know, on Facebook, it's really, we really have people who are more interested in this college content and they're clicking through more frequently, which helps them decide what kind of posts they're going to put on those different social channels. So it's kind of reverse engineering that. 
Um, and then, of course, well, actually, let me take one step back. You notice here in the right column here, we can still look at conversions, right? That, that's the golden thing. If we can get through all these different types of campaigns that people are doing and then understand which ones are converting highest on the goals, line number four for these guys is a giveaway. One of their goals is, of course, to sign up for the giveaway. So, of course, that's going to be a really high conversion rate. But if we're looking at some of the others, you notice that this Maroon Coats alumni group also has a relatively high conversion rate compared to the others. So um, it helps to understand what kind of content is really driving conversion as well as what kind of channel. And then, of course, they can dig down a little bit deeper and um, actually identify which of those posts, because they've got them all tagged so carefully, are driving those specific conversions um, and really arm their social media team with all kinds of additional data to really engage even better with the people that are out in their uh, out in their social world. So there's some really cool opportunities around social by just utilizing some of the things that uh, Shelby's already talked about. So after we do all these amazing campaigns to get people to our websites, of course we want them to convert, to complete whatever the goal is that we've set up in Google Analytics. So what happens when someone um, converts after multiple visits to our website? Which channel um, that they came from, uh, which channel actually gets the credit for that conversion? Which channel should get the credit for that conversion? And that's really an internal, uh, um, internal discussion that everybody needs to have with their team as to what, uh, what uh, um, attribution model is, is right for you. Um, so one thing I wanted to um, talk to about this is attribution, for me, attribution is super interesting, right? Uh, but you have to really go through the steps to see if you really even have an attribution problem. Maybe you don't and, you know, it's a good to know, but you really don't have to focus on it. So a couple things you can use to figure that out is um, your, your overall website, are you uh, getting typically a huge number of new visits? Uh, uh, are you, you know, do you have, let's say, I'm, and I'm throwing these percentages out there, but, you know, 70%, 80%, your website has 70 or 80% new visit percentage. Um, also, you can go into the multi-channel funnels area in GA and look at the path length. Um, so how many sessions does it take for people to actually convert on your website? Or how many days does it take for people to convert uh, or, or, or submit that goal, uh, whatever that goal is on your website? So if the answer to those two is short, let's say one session or one day, uh, and you have a fairly high new visit percentage, then you really don't have a big attribution challenge and, and you don't have to, to, to um, you know, it's always good to be aware, but you don't have to really dive down deep. And you can talk to, about attribution for a, a very long time and kind of go down rabbit holes. But let's talk about the different attribution models that Google Analytics uses. So, um, Last interaction and all that means is the last um, um, way that the uh, people got to your website, that last channel, um, when they convert that last interaction, that last uh, uh, touch point or channel is the one that's going to get that credit. Uh, Google Analytics uses this last non-direct click, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute, uh, and kind of the logic in, in that, uh, make some assumptions on that logic. Last AdWords, uh, that's kind of a pet peeve of mine, that makes no sense, but uh, it's there. Uh, <laughs> the first interaction, obviously, is that the first uh, channel or interaction gets all the credit. And then linear, it's spread out across all of them, and then time decay, and then position based. So let's talk about direct versus assisted conversions. So the easiest way to, to uh, um, look at this is to really look at a, an example. So let's say that I go to a website uh, on day one and I get there by clicking on a banner ad in a web, on a, on a um, 
an, an, another website. So I get to your website and I kind of tool around your website. I don't do anything. I just kind of read. Uh, maybe I, I do a lot of those micro conversions, but I'm not ready to take that macro conversion step. So I leave and the next day I come back uh, and let's say I remembered your school name. So I Google it and I click on a paid search ad. And I get to your website, and again, I kind of, I kind of look around, maybe watch a couple of videos or whatever it is, and I leave, and I don't make that 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 conversion or, or complete whatever goal it is you set up. And then the next day, I come in uh, through organic search, and this time I convert. I complete your form or, or whatever it is uh, that you've set up as the goal. So the organic search is going to get the direct conversion, and then the banner ad and the paid search search ad uh, are both going to get what Google Analytics calls these assisted conversions. So those assisted uh, uh, that conversion, but it wasn't the, the direct conversion. So Google Analytics by default gives credit to the last non-direct click. And at first this might seem, well, why did they why did they do that? And let's kind of uh, explain that. So let's take the example that I just used. And let's say, even after I got to the website through that organic search, I'm really not ready to convert yet. Uh, and then the next day, I come back. And I, I know your school now. I know your uh, URL now. So I type that right in, and I get to your website directly. And then I convert. Well, Google Analytics says, well, if you've typed in directly, or let's say you've bookmarked your website, then I already know about you. So let's give the credit for that conversion to something previous that happened. So that's why they're giving, that's uh, um, the assumption of why they're giving that, that uh, credit to the last non-direct click, because by, um, by definition, if somebody's coming to your website directly, they already know about you. There's a really good blog post, um, um, and as we're going through, I, I'm, I hope you've noticed that there are some blog post uh, URLs at the end of the slides that you can read for more information. This is a really good one that really is, explains in depth uh, uh, the direct visits and how Google Analytics attributes credit. So now let's shift gears. Um, now that we've talked about uh, attribution, let's talk about measuring content. Um, how do we really effectively measure content? And we can go back to, you know, those uh, our people, uh, once they get to your the page, their, their landing page, are people bouncing? Are they spending time there? Um, are they uh, going to different pages of your, your uh, website during that session? I think an underutilized uh, met metric can be page value. And in order to use page value in Google Analytics, you have to have a goal set up, and you also have to have a value um, um, for that goal. So let's make an example of you have a form that is your goal. You have a thank you page that triggers that goal. And you've said that that goal is worth, let's say, $5. So what you can do um, as far as content is concerned, you can go back to your pages report and um, the last column will talk about page value. And what that's really doing is when you uh, do convert, it's looking at all the previous pages that were in your kind of journey to convert during that session, and it's giving, uh, um, you know, that goal was worth, let's say, $5, and it's kind of divvying up uh, uh, um, value to those specific pages that were used to get to the ultimate goal. And this is a really good tool to use um, if you... Um, order by page value, you'll see that obviously the page right before your goal has the highest value. And what you can do is use the filter to filter out that page. And you really want to filter out, let's say, page views of less than, depending on what your traffic is, less than X, because the high value ones are, are going to be the ones with one page view or, or whatever that is. But what this can see, and then you'll have a list of kind of these pages with relatively high page value, and that can give you a kind of a priority of, of the content that maybe you need to look at. So um, maybe there are red flags there. A, maybe there's a page there that doesn't make sense to you, um, that isn't 
what you would think is typical in that journey to complete that goal. Um, or uh, it can give you um, a priority list of, of pages that you really need to potentially optimize or, or really pay attention to. So another um, um, tool that we can use to measure content is Crazy Egg. Uh, and Crazy Egg um, has a, a a bunch of different things that it can do. One of the main things is a heat map, so it'll tell you where people click on a on a specific page. Um, it also has a, a scroll map, so you can um, you can see how far people scroll on a particular page. Maybe you have, maybe you're again a news website and you put out a lot of content, a lot of these news articles, and you really want to know if people are, are um, scrolling and reading that, that, that uh, post, those articles. You can use something like Crazy Egg to really find that out. Uh, and obviously there are, are a bunch of alternatives. Mouse flow is one, click tail is one. Google actually has um, in-page um, analytics that can kind of get there. Uh, but but we've, we've seen that um, Crazy Egg is really a, a, really a neat tool. Um, and, you know, you might have internal, you know, uh, discussions on, on is, is the page fold uh, really a, a thing? Do, do people scroll? Um, are people reading? Uh, and, you know, the debate goes back and forth, but it is, you know, uh, um, Jacob Nielsen actually did a, did a study that was, uh, he posted it just in February. The fold still is a thing. However, there's a caveat to that. With um, the rise of mobile, there are totally different folds for your different um, devices. Uh, so you have to really pay attention to that. And it's not clear cut either because on one hand, uh, depending on the content, maybe your content's terrible and people aren't encouraged to scroll, scroll. They're not going to scroll. But maybe it's very compelling and maybe there are um, um, cues there uh, to um, obvious cues so people will scroll. So people will scroll if the content is compelling and there are obvious um, um, cues there, but you can use a tool like Crazy Egg to see just how much that's happening. And then don't forget about your videos. Videos are content as well, and um, hopefully um, the videos on your website, if you're using YouTube or maybe you're using a video management system like a Brightcove, they all have uh, analytics that you can look at. So how, um, how many views, obviously, are, is, a, is a video getting? How long do people uh, watch the video? Uh, and then if anybody has done this, um, this has been a challenge for us, but the ultimate would be to tie that video interaction to your ultimate goal. So you can see if, if people are, remember when we're talking about our micro conversions, um, do people who watch videos, do they convert more than others? Uh, and if you can really make that tie, and that's, that's, that's definitely a challenge, uh, but if you can make that tie, that would be a really, really good information to have. And then hopefully everybody's doing some A-B testing as well. Um, Optimizely is a really good tool for this. You can use Google Content Experiments. It's a little, um, a little bit more um, developer intensive uh, to use that. So Optimizely is a good alternative. Uh, Visual Website Optimizer, Unbounce, they all do kind of basically the same thing. And a lot of things that you can be testing, specifically if you have a form, very easy to test that. So the call to action button um, or the, the submit button, uh, if you want to change the label or the color or the size, your call to action buttons throughout um, or on a, on a separate or on a uh, single page. Uh, maybe you want to change the headline and see how that may affect uh, your ultimate um, goal. Uh, maybe you want to swap content. You want to try a certain piece of content to see if that's more or less effective. So that's another uh, A-B testing tools, and there are a ton of them. Optimizely, I'm just going to I, I have no idea if it's the most uh, uh, popular one. Um, it's one that we've used for um, a long time. Um, so that's a, that's a popular one. So now let's talk about 
off-site conversions. Uh, I know a lot of times, I, at least for, for us, a lot of times um, the, the ultimate conversion happens off the site, not on the site that you own and you maintain. So you can't track to the ultimate conversion. So what's the next best thing? And if you're using a content management system like Drupal or WordPress or even Joomla, um, all of them have plugins to be able to track off-site clicks as an event, uh, and you can set those up. Um, and that's really um, um, what we found is, is that the easiest thing to do is to track that off-site link as, um, as an event. You can use, if you're using Google Tag Manager, uh, you can set that up there. You can set it up directly um, 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 on your page if you're not. Uh, the other thing I, that I wanted to throw up here is um, if your ultimate conversion happens off-site, but it's not a third party, maybe it's owned and maintained by a different department within your university or within your college, then talk to your colleagues. Uh, uh, you know, bring them to lunch and talk about you know, the importance of, of, of digital analytics and, and what you can get out of it. And hey, it would be great if we could, uh, um, if we could talk about how we could, we could track that. Uh, uh, maybe you create a roll-up account in Google Analytics or you have some other uh, things that you can do. But um, if, the, uh, if the ultimate goal happens off your site but happens within your university, talk to people. See if, uh, see if that's even realistic for you to be able to track that. So the key takeaways, and, and, and hopefully you've got, uh, you got some things, got some uh, uh, tactics and techniques that you can use or different tools, uh, tool ideas. Um, Digital analytics isn't just about Google Analytics, as you um, saw from the very beginning. Uh, it's about all of these other tools that, that you can use and you should be using to, uh, to optimize your website, to measure your content and your email. Uh, and the trick is knowing your objectives and goals, using the right KPI for the job. Remember, you don't want to uh, use apply if those people are still in the research uh, part of their uh, uh, journey. Um, to get buy-in, one of the easiest ways is to show the value and show the struggle, show people kind of struggling on your website, and obviously use the right tool, um, use the right tool for the job. Great. Thanks so much, Shelby. Um, we're going to start taking some questions now, so if you guys want to take a couple of seconds, and if you have questions, type them into the, the question box, and we will get to them. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to take an opportunity to plug Converge 2015. <laughs> uh, this October in New Orleans, we are um, putting together the conference uh, that really, I, I really think that it's the inbound marketing conference that higher education doesn't want to miss. Um, we're focusing on bringing in a bunch of really great speakers from industry, but followed up and, and contributed also with people in higher education who are actually getting things done in, in the real world. So um, Shelby actually is going to be presenting and talking a little bit more about analytics there. Um, we also have Chris Seiden from Google, who is an analytics advocate for Google Analytics. Um, she's fantastic. She's actually just won some awards this year for uh, the work that she's doing in helping educate folks. Um, we have folks from HubSpot, from Moz, um, Margot Bloomstein, who's a great content strategist and has done a ton of work in higher education. And then we have speakers from all over different, uh, different colleges and universities. So we really encourage you to take a look at that. Um, we actually just extended our early bird. So take an opportunity to save a couple of bucks and go check that out on our website. Uh, so let's see if we got any questions coming in. Here we go. Bear with me just a second as I'm uh, reading through some of these, all right? Uh, here's a good question. Shelby, what do you think about this one? How do you determine what is a good new uh, visit percentage? Hmm, that's a good one. And I, I hate to say this, but the answer is always going to be it depends. Um, again, if you, it depends, I, I think it depends on the type of campaign that you're running. So if you are running a campaign um, toward people in those really upper, kind of those brand awareness or those people really uh, far up in the funnel, that research stage, that's really, um, you do want to look at that, that high vis uh, new visit percentage. And 
I actually don't think that there is an, it is a percentage uh, that you want to target. It depends on what your current percentage is and look at your campaigns that are targeting that is targeting people um, up in that in, in that uh, funnel. And what you can use is your current new visit percentage for those people as a benchmark. And then you can kind of tweak your campaign uh, to maybe be a bit more optimized to people um, up in that funnel uh, 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 or, or, or other items. And then you can see if that trend uh, increases, if you increase those uh, that new new visit percentage from those people. So I don't think that there's kind of, I don't know of any kind of industry standard, uh, but it really, that's, you really have to know what yours is and then work to um, get that, uh, to increase that. Yeah, that, that's a metric that I've seen over and over again, people sort of manipulate. <laughs> <Because> <laughs> yes. You can say, oh, look, we're getting all these new visitors, or the opposite, you can say, oh, look, we have really loyal people. So I think, I think right. so it depends exactly on, on what the case is. Mm -hmm. so, um, so here's another question. When doing user experience testing, are there specific questions or tasks you recommend asking a tester to accomplish? Um, this this does uh, this does depend too. It depends on if you're focusing on a certain area of your website. Uh, so um, let's say uh, going back to that tuition example. Uh, so if you think about those micro conversions, you know, sit, sit down and think about what do people need to know or understand before they get to whatever that macro goal is. So you can use that to kind of, of come up with those tasks, right? So people need to know how much it costs. People need to know, uh, you know, um, if they're interested in a certain degree or if they're interested in your school. Maybe you have a huge school and people uh, uh, um, need to know that because they really want a small school or vice versa. Uh, so it really, you really have to sit down and kind of know what your micro conversions are, I think, before you come up with that. And then it really does depend, too, if you know you have a problem area of your website. So um, let's say, um, using that tuition example again, you know that it's really hard for people uh, to get to, uh, let's say, tuition. So again, I'm, I'm constantly shocked at, at how many um, um, websites don't have that kind of clear uh, as to what that is. So you can do a whole user, um, user test just around tuition, um, can they um, can they get to it? Uh, you know, where would you go to find our tuition? Uh, if you live, if you live in, let's say, Austin, Texas, uh, what would your tuition be if you had twenty credits? So be you know be be very specific, and and it's not that they can accomplish exactly what that goal is, but you're really looking at what is their thought process. Can they easily go through those steps and say, oh, okay, so here's my tuition. I'm out of state, uh, and I have, you know, I'm bringing in 20 credits. Uh, can they go through that process? Um, and then you may want to do kind of overall, um, uh, what, what is your impression when you get to this website? And you you kind of want to be careful with those, uh, but you know, um, if if your your school wants to, uh, uh, you know, for for brand sake, if they're looking at a, a specific area, uh, you can look at that tool. What is your impression? What is your perception of our school uh, when you get to our website? And again, um, um, talk to uh, talk to people who have done that a lot, or, or you know. Uh, uh, those kind of questions because those can get a little tricky, uh, but I hope that helps. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've, got a, we've got quite a few questions here, so we're rocking and rolling. Let me, uh, this one sure. might be a quick one. Um, when measuring content, how do you set that page value? Do um, you want to take that or do you want me to? Um, you can, uh, well, you need, you need to have a goal set up and you also need to have a value for that goal. And I don't know, is the question more of not technically how to do it in Google, Google analytics, but how do you kind of come up with what that value is? Um, so to come up with what that value is, uh, the, the specific number or the dollar amount, what Google analytics uses this dollar amount, uh, is 
is kind of not that important. Um, so if you, um, it, the importance is that you just kind of assign something to it. So if you have groups of people uh, um, submitting, let's say, a form, and you can very logically group them in large groups, and maybe one large group uh, uh, is more valuable than another group, then you can easily say, let's say the, the more valuable group is going to be worth $4, and the less valuable group, and that sounds terrible, but the less <laughs> valuable group is going to be you know, $2. You can kind of do it that way. So don't really focus on what the specific value is. Just get something in there and then be consistent uh, and look at that consistently across. Um, what do you think about that, Becky? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, when, when I'm usually teaching about it, we talk about it as kind of funny money. Um, these are not numbers that you take to accounting by any means. Right, right. And we think of it as kind of an index. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, next question, how do you determine what stage your audience is at? Um, I think that this... <laughs> I'm sorry? But I think that's a whole webinar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, wow, that's... A, you know, I've actually haven't really thought about that. But when you're... Uh, uh, you know, when you're creating that campaign, you really have to think about um, who are you trying to attract? You know, um, you can't, if you're doing all of your campaigns to people uh, um, who are ready to apply, um, uh, you're, you're missing a whole bunch, a uh, whole boatload of people uh, that are really just in that decision-making um, process. So, um, hmm, I don't think I'm really answering this question. Um, I think it goes to kind of your overall strategy and making sure that you have some of that mapped out in the first place. Like we use a lot of um, communications flow maps and those different communications flow, which tie into each one of those campaigns. Yep. We think that's where people are. I think the trickiest part, with, especially with Google Analytics, is once they get to your site, it's hard to identify who those people are. So sometimes what we try to do is figure out some different actions that they might be taking that we say this um, this action, if they actually go and fill out a request for information, now we know what stage they're in versus somebody who might be at the top of the funnel and they're maybe just watching videos. But that doesn't mean that it's always perfect and somebody who may have already uh, applied might go watch a video. So I don't sure. know that it's Absolutely. Does that help? Yeah, definitely. And, um, and you're right. Yeah. And we do see that a lot. People who have already applied, um, for some reason, they come back and they request information, uh, or they're a student and they and they, you know, and that's perfectly, you know, it's not, it's definitely not a linear process. Mm -hmm. I'm sure many people on the phone can attest to that. Um, cool, great questions, everybody. Um, we got a couple more, so bear with me. <laughs> okay. um, uh, have any or many colleges enabled Google Analytics interest and demographics? Have you guys done that? Um, we have, we haven't, um, uh, we haven't looked at it. Um, we we sort of look at it, but we haven't really uh, uh, have, haven't um, really looked at it in depth. I should say we do have it enabled, though. Cool. Yeah, I think that's a great question, and I think probably a lot of you are noticing that popping up. Um, I work with tons of schools and have access to a lot of analytics. If I was going to ballpark it, I'd say maybe. 15, 20% of schools that I start working with actually have that set up already. So it's not a ton of people. Um, you do need to be in universal analytics to have that set up, and you need to make this little edit to your privacy policy that tells people that you're actually collecting that information. So the question of how many people have done that, I don't know the answer to. But, um, please do make that edit if you're going to grab that. Um, it's actually really good information that is coming from people who are logged into Primarily, it's a lot of social networks, but any other any other third parties that are agreed to pass some of that self-identified information, like my age, my sex, my interests, those sorts of things, that you pass that through anonymously to Google Analytics. Um, at first, when it came out, I was like, how much information is that really going to be? On our site, personally, we're seeing probably about 60% of the sessions actually come through that info. So it's actually pretty good info. Um, what else? 
Okay, Shelby, can you give an example of how to use attribution information to inform strategy? Um, what do you do with attribution information? How do you take action and make decisions based on it? Good question. Oh, this is a really good one. Yes. Um, I think that what what you want to do is, um, you know, if we're going back to the different kind of stages of, of the journey uh, and we're going back to um, uh, using the right KPI for the campaign. So if a campaign is really gorgeous, geared toward uh, brand awareness. And I really think that this, um, the and a good example of this is Google Display or, or Display Ads. You know, um, typically if they, if they come through, uh, they're not ready to kind of apply or to enroll or whatever that is. So a lot of times um, what you want to look at for those really high up in the funnel campaigns is you want to look at your assisted conversions. Are they assisting those direct conversions? And if they aren't, then maybe you need to tweak them. And if they are, that's fantastic. Um, but that's uh, uh, an area that, that we've looked at is if we are definitely um, targeting those people way up in the funnel, then um, we would look at not that direct conversion, but the, um, but the assisted conversions. Perfect. Um, and last question. Thanks, everybody, for uh, hanging with us. Um, and this, one, this is a great one to end on, actually. In your experience, what is the most vital and underutilized area to measure? Internal site search. Yeah. Um, I think that's, and, and again, uh, in, well, I will, I will um, asterisk this. It depends on how much it's used on your website. Um, but I do think that uh, um, you can get so many great nuggets of information from there. Uh, and a, so here's a perfect example of that. And it's like tuition is like my perfect example for everything. But years and years ago when World Campus, uh, we were um, uh, redesigning the World Campus website specifically. Uh, our old website uh, did not have um, a very clear place to get to tuition. Um, and how we, and, and, and again, we redesigned it to, oh boy, I forget what year it was, 2011. But anyway, before, before that, with our really old site, uh, we did, that came up as a red flag because we were looking at internal site search. So, um, we saw tuition was, you know, one of the, the highest searched internal site search terms. And we actually used that when we were redesigning the site. Uh, and we did some usa usability testing around that and really kind of honed in on that. Uh, uh, and we used that as a, as a red flag. You know what? Why aren't people able to find tuition? Because, uh, you know, for us it was obvious. Uh, but for the users, it obviously wasn't obvious. Uh, and then you can use that is as those red flags. Uh, um, we've used that again in troubleshooting campaigns too. It's really, really good uh, for that. And again, it really depends on how much people use that. Uh, you know, if you're getting, a, a, even if you're getting, let's say, 7 10% of your users using internal site search, depending on your traffic, uh, you can get some really valuable information. And you'll get information that is, you know, typical, and, and, and that's fine. But, but sometimes you'll see some real nuggets in there. Well, wonderful. Great question. Um, so we ran a little bit over. Thanks, everybody, for hanging with us. Um, I think it was worth it to get to your questions. So um, a huge, huge thank you to Shelby. We're so grateful to have you on this webinar. And um, Thank you. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you all in New Orleans. <laughs> <laughs>